Hi, we're here today with Bill Weldon, former chairman and CEO of Johnson & Johnson, today board member, among others, of J.P. Morgan, Chase, uh, CVS, and uh, Exxon. So let me ask you, Bill, um, you started out in a 40-year career at J&J &J and started out right out of school and ended up as the CEO and chairman. How did you change in your leadership along the way? Oh, wow. Um, I, you know, I would say that th the biggest change is, you know, in the beginning you're dependent upon yourself. And at the end you realize you're dependent upon managing others and then managing through others. And I think that the, you know, your, your basic fundamental management philosophy, mine has always been inspiring and motivating people and helping them to really achieve more than they ever believed they could achieve. And, and I think you learn that through trial and error. And, you know, I made many mistakes and, you know, probably many more mistakes than successes. But, but I think you learn that through trying to have, you know, I, I, you know the, the interpersonal side of caring about people, not as a social worker, but as a boss, and um, and really being honest and direct. And I think you you kind of you just kind of evolve as over time with experiences that you have. When you're in a company that size and you stay as long as you have, and you look back on it, if you were talking to yourself when you were 23 or 24 when you went to work there, would you say, "I'm going to stay here five years or seven years," or would you go on for some other kind of career if you were now at that stage? Well, you know, it, I, I had this very sordid background in a way. I was married as a sophomore in college, and um, well, I was on my way to medical school, and I had somebody who was going to put me through, and he developed pancreatic cancer. Mm -hmm. And so I withdrew my applications. Um, my wife graduated ahead of me and kind of finished putting me through school. And then um, when I decided, you know, that I had to go pay some bills and be responsible and then about a, six months after I graduated my daughter, daughter was born and I had one interview with the intent of just getting our feet on the ground and going back to school and um, anyway as it evolved things worked out well and, and I, can, I can say that it was best put by a friend of mine who I recruited from, from France. He was the youngest transplant surgeon ever in, in France, in Paris and Guy was trained under Stargell at Pitt and I said to Guy, why did, why did you come? And he said, you know, Bill, when I'm operating, I'm saving one person. When I work at j and &J, I'm saving thousands of people. And that really kind of summarizes, I think, why so many of us, even though it may not be our intent to stay, end up staying because healthcare is a wonderful place to be. And j and &J, to me, is a very special company. j and &J <clears throat> is huge. It has multiple divisions. I mean, I know you're organized in three buckets now, but it's all over the world. Um, I I think at the time, something like 130,000 people that you were managing. How, how do you create coherence? How do you get them all focused on this big arrow that's the direction of the company, even though most will never set eyes on you? The, the simplest way to explain that, Judy, is our credo. You know, it's, and I always say, if you want to hear, read a great credo, look at Enron's. They just never practiced it. The difference with J&J's credo is it's something that, and you have to talk about it. You have to refresh it. People have to understand you're serious about it. And, and our credo basically says four things. And it says we need to worry first about the people that use our products, second, our employees, third is socially, be socially responsible in the communities in which we live and work. And the fourth one is a shareholder. If we do that, should get a fair return. Not the best because we manage for the long term, but a fair return. And I think if you really think about that, and you can go any place in the world and you will see our credo there. And it's not just sitting there and symbolically, it's something that anybody at J&J &J you talk to will talk to you about it. And I think that was a unifying force. Um, and you know, I could tell you about, you know, uh, FCPA issues we had and other things where we've had problems and you know when you deal with that size of uh, an organization that many people you will have problems but I really think it is that our credo that that kind of binds us it's a glue that holds us together and probably the single most decentralized company in the world and then each of the management people I mean you're right half the people had no idea who I was but they knew who their boss was and it was having extraordinary people that I was able to work through and with that actually brought us together in a way that allowed us to be proud of the organization. How do you, in this world of disruption that's happening now, how do you um, keep an eye on that and yet take advantage of it? 
at the same time? You have to move with the times. So I think technology is, a, is an extraordinary enabler for healthcare, for whether it's medical devices or consumer or, or drugs. Um, and, you know, I now chair this company up in Redwood City, which is really the, the cutting edge of, of the integration of technology and diagnostics to look at your cardiovascular system. And, and I think that you have to evolve. I, I'm a scientist by education, but I don't consider, compared to the people today, myself a scientist at all. And these, these individuals work in cerebral areas I've never thought about entering in. And they're not only brilliant scientists, physicians, they're brilliant technologists. And they have a way of bringing this all together. And, and I do think technology is a great enabler for tremendous advances we're going to see in healthcare. Um, I think it also allows us to, to unify the organization, to communicate. To, there's so many things that technology really is, enables us to do that, you know, when I was there we couldn't do. J&J is a very storied company with a long history and frankly a J&J way. And yet the world is changing so dramatically. How do you protect the spirit of insurgency in such an entrenched incumbent? You know, I, I, I think the, the thing to understand is J&J is decentralized, as we said earlier. It's 250 operating companies, and we always say it's the men and women that run those companies. I, I always said I was overhead. I was not really important. They're the important folks. And, you know, and, and what we do is you have to get past the not invented here mentality. So, you know, we have our research scientists, we have our engineers that are, you know, working on technology and everything, and yet we look around the world for opportunities. And we're probably better known for development of, of an opportunity we acquire than actually discovering, you know, or, or inventing through, through um, science or, or technology or engineering. But what I think it is, is we're able to go out and buy. So during my tenure, I think we, we acquired 60 companies. And what, what I think we're really good at is when something becomes a real commodity and the pricing, we invented stents, but we got out of the stent business because the price of stents was going like this, the utilization of stents was going like this, and we said it cost too much to continue to reinvest, so we sold the company. And then we bought another, you know, we'd buy a biotech company or we'd buy another company. We bought a company um, in the uh, trauma area, um, Synthes. And, you know, it allows us to keep regenerating ourselves, not just through what we do, but through the knowledge of what's going on in the space. And we also, we also are very careful. Um, we do realize what we know, and we also realize what we don't know. So we're not going to go buy automobiles, because we don't know that. And we know that when we did get into large capital equipment at one point with a company called Technicare, we, we really killed us. We lost a lot and, you know, realized that's not where our strengths are. So we kind of keep it where our strengths are, but we, we, we look at what can we do internally, where's everything else coming from, buy companies, merge, you know, form joint ventures, ventures, whatever it may be, that keeps us on the cutting edge and hopefully keeps us ahead of other things. What do you have to do personally to keep your curiosity, constantly being curious? What, do you, what, what other things do you do to keep that wide vision of opportunity? Well, you know, you, you have uh, first of all, you have to be inquisitive and curious, which uh, I just, I guess people always say I ask too many questions. But, but you know, you, you have a, a nucleus of people that you know that kind of keep you going. We had a small group in New York that we were all, we all became CEOs at the same time. And it was Sam Palmisano, Ken Chenault, Jeff Immelt, myself. And we would get together quarterly and talk about things. And, and we didn't compete, so we didn't need lawyers in the room. We didn't need any of that. We could just keep ourselves kind of intrigued with what's going on in Washington. How do we contribute here? What do we do there? Um, I remember at one point, President Obama asked us to come in, and, or his chief of staff did, and tell him what we really thought was going on and other things. And I, I think you just form this network. You get involved with, with various people that are also curious. Um, I love science, so I would be very involved with the scientists and go out. And to me, I would go out and, you know, go to the, you know, the research companies and spend a lot of time with those guys and ask questions and, and just learn. And I think it's just a natural inquisitiveness. But you have to have a network. I mean, you can't sit in your office. I, I mean, I, I used to keep track of my time. I spent two thirds of my time out of my office. Um, traveling and doing things, whether it was to you know Asia or Europe or here in the United States, 
and learning what's going on. And I think you, you do that by getting out, not sitting in and, you know, I just don't think you can sit behind a desk and really be a contributor. Part of the challenge is to communicate your vision throughout this lumbering giant. How did you communicate and what were the most effective ways that you found for communication? You know, Judy, I, I think aligning people behind a vision and inspiring people is critically important. And I think that the way I would do it is I traveled a lot. So I would go around the world um, every year with um, some of the management team and I would meet with large groups and small groups. I think at one time I looked at it and I said most of my time is spent with others because I think that's it. You know, but, but you have your meetings, you have technology you can use today, but I still believe that I like to get in front of people, I like to look at people, and I like to talk to people. Um, and I think that's how you really get alignment. Uh, now, there's the other side of that, and that is I, I'm a believer that you close the door, you get in a room, and you can yell and scream at each other, you can throw things at each other, but you come out aligned. You know, you, yeah, and you get a better decision by, by being able to feel you can have that really direct inter interaction, but you come out of it aligned and then you all go out and march to the same drummer. So we had, you know, we had um, the, the people that ran the businesses that reported to me, the one person in consumer, you know, medical devices and um, pharmaceuticals, and we would come out really aligned. And even when we looked at acquisitions, we would sit around a table and we would rack and stack them and say, we only have so much money. What will bring the, the greatest value? What is, you know, you make it simple. You know, if you want to be successful in healthcare. You look at cardiovasculars, you look at arthritis, you look at oncology, you know, you can probably name the six disease states that account for 70% of your expenditures. And, and then you look at the dy dynamics of the aging, the demographics of, of us getting older. So you want to get into hips and knees and joints and you want to do the things that all of us are, are getting. So it's not really hard to figure that out. It's pretty straightforward. But then you rack and stack to say, okay, if we only have so much money, the people in the consumer business want to buy, you know, another Neutrogena, which we bought at one point. Somebody in farm wants to buy a biotech company and somebody in devices wants to buy an implant company. You know, you have to make decisions and that's where we get in a room and kind of bat it around and debate it and figure it out. Do people buy the brand Johnson & Johnson? Do they buy the bond Johnson & Johnson? Do they buy just the product Johnson & Johnson? What do you think goes into that alchemy? You know what's one of the most interesting things about Johnson & Johnson is <clears throat> we had a thing called the golden egg. And we, we if you think about J&J, &J, it's motherhood, softness, children, all of those things, which really is the consumer products end of J&J. &J. Baby powder, shampoo, all of those things. And we intentionally kept that to the consumer area because the pharmaceutical area and the medical device area are much higher risk and can damage the brand. But if you keep it down here with the consumer area, it's really good. Now, you know, most people don't realize the size of J&J. &J. They don't realize that, you know, the big, the consumer is actually a very small part of J&J. &J. And it's, you know, it's, I mean, it's, it's a very substantial company. But, but, the, um, but we, we kept it that way. And, the farm people and the medical device people always said, we want to, we want to be able to use the J&J &J name. And you got to the point with the media where if you had a problem in Janssen, they'd say it's, you know, J&J. &J. So what we started to do is to say Janssen, a Johnson & Johnson company we'd put on the bottle, or Ethicon, a Johnson & Johnson company. But we didn't go out and say Johnson & Johnson sutures for Ethicon, which is the number one suture. We still said it's Ethicon. And people relate to the the individual brand, we had a conversation last night which is, was kind of an interesting conversation and it, and it dealt with people like to relate to a brand more than just a conglomerate. So when you go to the operating room, the largest sutures in the world are Johnson or, or Ethicon, which happens to be a Johnson & Johnson company. You go to endoscopic surgery, the largest maker of it are Ethicon endosurgery instruments. You go into orthopedics, you know, knees and hips and trauma and backs and everything. The largest company in the world is Depew, which is a J&J &J company. So if you talk to an orthopedic surgeon, they know Depew. If you talk to surgeons, they know Ethicon, they know Ethicon endo. You, you talk to, you know, ophthalmologists and they know AccuView, they're all J&J &J companies, but they don't carry the J&J &J name, even though everyone knows it's J&J. &J. Well, we thank you, Bill, for visiting and for being such a friend to UCLA. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks.